Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to, uh, to come back and thank you for coming. To, uh, it's always nice someone might be interested in your experience and some insights you have. When, when George wrote me and asked me to come back, my first inclination was, it's been 19 years, George. <laughs> 2005, <clears throat> uh, not 19, 14 years, 2005. And uh, what new do I have to the field? The field has moved on from my... And then I thought more about it, and what's happened to me since I have retired is that I have flipped to the other side, meaning I am now a person <clears throat> in the community who uses university resources and works with faculty on projects I'm doing, and I have a new appreciation for being on the other side. An experience I wish I had had when I was actually helping manage and lead the program on campus because it's opened my eyes, if you will, of the complexity for those of us on the other side and working with universities. So <clears throat> that led to my thinking about reciprocity. And just to be cute, I added the word equation on it. But it actually has some power as a metaphor so that's the reason I chose to talk about the reciprocity equation, and George thought it was a good idea. So thank you, George. Uh, it's nice to be here. What I intend to do is take the first part of this presentation, which will be very quick, but filled with most of the pictures, and talk about my experience in growing a biofuel called Miscanthus giganthus, or MXG. <clears throat> And that forms the case study for working with the University of Iowa, Iowa State University, and then a private company, Agritech. And what it's, and my, well, I'll just say, it. one of my worries is um, in working in partnerships is that I have been successful in part because I understand universities. But I'm unique in your partnerships. Um, I know how to work around things. I know how to network. I know how to call people to find out what's going on or how to get services. And I've used all of those informal channels to make things happen. So I retired in 2005. Uh, people asked me when I retire, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to go farm. People laughed at me, but it was true. Uh, I grew up on a farm in Iowa. And um, my father and I had very similar personalities, and I figured out pretty soon that we probably wouldn't be a successful partnership at that stage in our lives. And so rather than go to Iowa State University, I went to the University of Iowa. And of course, the rest is history in terms of ending up where I ended up. Uh, but I always went to the farm for renewal and sustenance. Whenever I had a major crisis, whether it was here or at the University of Minnesota where I worked, I always spent the week, next weekend <clears throat> walking the fields and walking the timber. And so, and then as dad's health failed, I became more and more involved in the management of the farm. And so when the point came, sort of happened almost the same time, my retiring and uh, needing to be a much more active role in the farm. So I did return to the farm, and that's been my principal work. Uh, I've really become a quite active farmer, active on both, in, we're a, a corn and soybeans farm, um, but I have taken our marginal lands and converted them back into prairie, tried to worry a bit about cover crops and uh, some of the issues of nutrient uh, runoff, uh, planted trees, and then I've had this opportunity to uh, get involved in growing miscanthus. So as I became more involved in farming, two goals began to emerge for me as I worked on the issues. One was, it became clear to me anyway, that corn is not a stable crop into the future. Ethanol is a great, I won't say, there are people who hate ethanol, I will say 
Ethanol has cleaned the air for a lot of cities because of its role, but it doesn't have a real long-term future. It's only tied to the use of fuse to fossil fuels. So as fossil fuel use goes down, ethanol use. So I worry about corn as a product. Soybeans, on the other hand, has, it seems, unlimited uses as an oil and as a product that can be made into uh, things. So, uh, but I was looking for a third cash crop. Uh, secondly, I've developed a strong interest in perennial crops because tillage is a big issue with erosion for losing topsoil. The degree to which we can go back to perennial grains and perennial crops to feed both livestock and humans, the more secure farming is going to be in the long term. And there's an institute out in Colorado uh, the Land Institute, which has made major breakthroughs in the growing of rice and the growing of a wheat grain called Kernza that are perennial, that you don't have to replant the seed every year and continue to harvest. So I was also looking for something that would be more perennial as a crop that I could work on. So in 20, 2013, this would have been in 2012, um, I was at church, and the head of the power plant at the University of Iowa was a member there, and we were having coffee, and he mentioned that he was getting involved. The university had made a commitment to zero coal, and that they were looking for people who would help them pilot growing biofuels. And I just said, I will, <clears throat> which say something maybe to the younger crowd. In my retirement, I have said yes without thinking about the implications <laughs> to two or three major things, and each of them have been fantastic. One of them was I'm a musician, I play tuba, but I'm not a very good musician. But I had a, a director of a lower level band who had been directing the Eastern Iowa Brass Band, which is a semi professional band, and she needed a tuba player to fill in for a comp. Uh, a contest. So she asked me, would you be interested? Yes. Then I went home and realized, for the, those of you who are musicians know, tuba players play bass clef music. Brass band is all in treble clef. So in three weeks I had to learn a totally different set of fingerings and get the mind straightened around. Well, it's turned out to be great. It's I've been doing it now six years and I had rehearsal last night, and it's one of the highlights of my week, spending two hours with a group of musicians that range, I'm the oldest, to the youngest is uh, a senior in college, uh, and not spread out all between, but it's just so, I love the music, and it's fun being in a cross-generational group. Like. So, and, and to those of you thinking about retirement, people tell you, you know, don't jump too soon into something, hogwash. <laughs> You can always jump out. <laughs> so I think if your passion finds something, you should go for it. And like I say, if it didn't work out, you can always jump out. You don't have to, it's not like work. <laughs> uh, we, you know, you can go in and out. So whatever. So anyway, I ran into that we. So I learned more about this partnership, and I will talk a little bit more about it in a minute. But it's a three-way partnership. The University of Iowa has the need for a biofuel. It has no agriculture departments and no experience as an institution. Iowa State University hired one of the University of Illinois PhD graduates, Emily Heaton, to head up their renewable fuels research program. Turns out that Emily and I worked together when I was here in government relations showing the congressman and the governor and others about the Miscanthus project. So I actually knew what Miscanthus was when it was mentioned, which I may have been one of a handful of farmers in the state of Iowa who understood that. So Iowa State brings the agronomic expertise and then a private company, Agrotech. They're a small company that is emerging in the biofuels industry and they provide the feedstock, the rhizomes, the planting skills, the harvesting skills, the 
technical side, if you will. So it's a, and then the growers, people like me, landowners who can grow. So part of the dynamics, I use this as a case study, but I think these are generalized to MSTE or any of the projects in extension or anytime you're working with the public. Uh, partners have different goals. I was naive enough not to think about that when I got first involved. You have multiple decision makers and none of them report to each other. So one of the things that I learned as a landowner, I had to somehow be a project manager. That's not a role I had bought into. I mean, that never occurred to me. And I don't know how many school superintendents or teachers feel that they end up being project managers with the graduate students and the faculty and that coming in. Uh, the organization, and I said no one reports to each other, so it's a complex organization. It's not simple at all. Multiple expectations and needs, different levels of experience in agriculture, which can be a real challenge because the University of Iowa people who are the financial people, they, they're the people who have invested in the leases, they're paying for the rhizomes, they're paying for the harvest. So uh, the University of Iowa wants a secure source of biomass, Iowa State University, uh, Emily is, Emily Heaton is, wants to grow her department. Uh, Iowa, she uh, is a evangel, evangelistic about Miscanthus, wants it spread throughout Iowa. So she's looking for growers and opportunities. She has graduate students who need support, <laughs> graduate students who need research questions. Um, she needs places to field test findings that she gets from small trials that she's doing. AgriGrowTech, the company, uh, they provide all the services and they're, they're a business. I mean, so they have a bottom line. They want to make money. They want to make money in this field, uh, but in the bottom, and the bottom line is, you know, there's, you got to make more money than you spend. And so that goal gets involved in things, but I must say they're quite generous. And then as a landowner, on the very basic, it's an economic issue too. We'd like to get a return at least as good as conservation reserve program payments, which can range anywhere from 150 to $220 an acre, mostly under $200 an acre in Iowa. Um, and then there are people like me, and I am a minority among the landowners in our area that are growing it. I'm actually interested in knowing enough about it that I can grow it myself, market myself, and become an independent grower without a dependence upon the University of Iowa as a market for my product. So, uh, and I have another colleague, Dan Black, who has similar kind of interests in doing it. So the issues, I mentioned the ag expertise issue, the agro tech, um, turns out that where Miscanthus really grows well is in the south, and that's where the product got started as a biofuel and as a bedding for uh, poultry houses. It's a very absorbent material, much better than straw. I don't know if you use straw in your gardening or anything or hay, but it's very absorbent. So there are, and there, when you go online and want service providers, there's only the two that I know of, AgroGrowTech and then a company in Ontario. And the company in Ontario is who we first started to work with and their CEO tragically was killed in Brazil. And so they went through a lot of internal issues. So we switched to a different service provider. Um, just as a, an aside here, it turns out that, I mean, why should this surprise us? But Europe is way ahead of us on this. Uh, Great Britain, Germany, the Eastern European countries, Holland, uh, Denmark, all are growing miscanthus as biofuels. They heat 
their uh, livestock operations as well as heat their homes. They use it for bedding. They use it uh, as mulch. Uh, lots of uses. And one of the highlights for me in September is I was in Germany and I visited a, uh, a grower and his dad. Uh, Anton got a, did a study year abroad in Florida. Uh, but anyway, Anton is you know, in his early 30s. And uh, for him, he just sees nothing but future out there <laughs> in terms of its growth and development in, uh, in Europe. So, yeah. Say it again. Yes, yeah, yep. Yeah, I visited. In fact, I'm going down there after this to talk about doing some trials in Iowa. Talking about. It is. Uh, you got it from Eric uh, Rund. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, one of the, because of my interest in Miscanthus, I got to know Eric Rund, who farms down at Pasodum. And uh, Eric has really been my mentor. Whenever I have a problem, I'm on the phone. Eric, what do you do? <laughs> and when he has a problem, he's on the phone. <laughs> you guys had this experience yet? <laughs> you know, kind of. So that network is beginning to. So I'll see Eric also about two o'clock this afternoon and catch up. But, um, but there's the problem with them being in North, North Carolina. It's not Illinois. It is not Iowa. We have different soils. The soils behave differently when they're wet. Iowa State's faculty, students have very narrow interests. As a grower, I have broader interests. And I really have sometimes very specific questions, but that's not the research they're following right now. And so uh, that's, and then the landowners are a mix of active and passive growers. Um, I have neighbors who tell me, Steve, I don't care what they do out there, just send me the check. So reciprocity, I thought this word cloud probably was a good place to begin. If nothing else, just that it's very complex. And what does it mean? You know, at the base, it means in the political sense, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Uh, but it does mean that whomever we as a university are working with in the public and as a public person working with the university, uh, we both have expect benefits, and we both have needs, and we both have expectations, and they're going to be different. So how do we work to understand that exchange of knowledge and how do we build it into the process so that you don't have unhappy clients. You know, you, I keep picking on MSTE, but, you know, teacher says, hey, you told me that, you know, 90% of our kids would be up to this level if we use this software. It's not working. And you have to say, well, you know, it depends on the kids and it depends on the setting and how their backgrounds were and, and so forth. Uh, Steve, you parallel yes. Please, I'm here with the Technology Center of DuPage. I are working with them. It's point by point. <laughs> so, uh, keep hitting this. So, reciprocity. So, let me say some of the issues. Uh, I went through that. <clears throat> so, w what do I want, you know, as a landowner? I'm on the outside of the university now. I have a need, whatever it might be in healthcare or teaching or in the business world or whatever. What is it? Uh, in my terms, it's agri- is that I need to know how much to spend on fertilizer. You know, and to get the answer back, it depends, isn't that useful? I know in corn, I need to spend, you know, 200 pounds per acre. What do I need to do for this plant? Well, it used to, it used to say 50. Now it's been moved up to, well, to hedge your bets, maybe 100 pounds of nitrogen every other year. But that's all a cost factor, because one of the things that I've learned in leaving the university is that I now run a small business. And I suddenly have a different appreciation, if you will, for the bottom line. <laughs> that you know, every dollar out is, 
is a dollar out. It's not necessarily, you hope it's a dollar in on the other end, but if it's a dollar out and you don't need to have spent it, you know, you shouldn't spend it. But anyway, that's an aside. So I have a lot of questions about how to grow the product. Um, being recognized as an important partner. I was surprised how much, and maybe it's because I used to work at universities, but I wanted to have some recognition, something about being important. And I don't know whether you build in recognition programs for your partners, but I sure wished I had it when I was here. I think making sure the partners feel appreciated and uh, I do remember, I was just asking about the East St. Louis Research Project, because I do remember standing besides one of the many former, former mayors of East St. Louis <laughs> at a dedication when I was in East St. Louis representing university and, and saying something to him. First of all, he thanked me for being there. And then he said, I asked him about, well, tell me the things you kind of need for this project. He looked at me and he says, you really mean that? <laughs> You, you really want to hear what we need? I said, yeah. He said, well, not many people ask that question. <laughs> it's mostly giving. You know, we have this product. We have this piece of knowledge that you can use. But how do you? So that, that recognition piece, timely follow through on commitments, um, that frustrates me as much as anything um, because I see... Uh, People in decision making just delay decision after decision about when we're going to plant, when we're going to harvest, getting back an answer about uh, like the fertilizer issue and so forth. It's just, I'd rather have them say, well, we don't know. But regular communication. Can I answer that? Yeah. Recognize as an important partner. When you were working with us at the Technology Center for DuPage, which is a high school, sort of career oriented, uh, my guess is that that's the only school probably in the state that's been visited by two chancellors, thanks to you. You brought in chancellors. They couldn't have. That's a big deal for a school. A ch chancellor of the University of Illinois is here visiting us. You recognize that's... No, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. Yeah. So. Uh, so re how do we rebalance the reciprocity equation? This is where I've been doing my thinking the last month or so since George and I talked. Somehow negotiate expectations. Maybe you do that already, but I think it's, I don't think I did very much of that when I was working with partners. Um, acknowledge the value of tacit practical local knowledge. Let me tell you, those are people out there on the front line know a lot about putting things into action. And when you, you know, university has have a reputation, uh, nobody in this room is like that, but <laughs> of, of preaching, you know, just, you know, and at, at a level that, of abstraction <laughs> that doesn't make it. So um, tweak the research. Uh, I know it's hard. Because, you know, grants are very narrow. Uh, to study something, you really have to chop it up into very small pieces. But it is a little frustrating to sit in a research seminar and have, you know, it chopped up so small. And the timelines on the outcomes so far out that, because you need the information now. I mean, you want it for next spring. <laughs> And I, I realize that that's not possible, but it's just one of the things when you're working with research knowledge and with the public, to be able to tweak things a little bit to meet needs would be nice. Communicate regularly. You know, that's an old saw, but man, is it true in public engagement. One university contact. It, like I told you, we have, with Iowa, we have two people in charge of two different parts of the project and they report to different people in the university who eventually report to the same vice president but it takes a while to get up to that piece and um, 
I simply don't know who's responsible for what. You know, if we have a weed problem, who's responsible for that? Well, I guess I've been told X is, but nothing seems to happen, so I don't know. So, I mean, that's a, it's frustrating now. I know enough to work around the systems. I know the head of the power plant. I, you know, go over their heads, things like that. I don't. But I know how to work the systems to get the information I need. But most growers, most people out in the business field don't have my university experience of working the internal politics of a university. So, uh, so some of the people I work with, I didn't know whether Emily's colleagues would be here or not. Uh, Ingrid uh, handles the contract. She's an attorney, dressed in black. They're tough. Uh, Ingrid is an attorney, works for the power plant, negotiates lots and lots of contracts for the power plant, and she does our land contracts uh, and helps uh, oversee the planting piece with the company. Uh, Nick is, a, uh, is now a, a doctorate, and he's now doing a postdoc at Iowa State in the field, is brilliant and knows a lot about the internal operations of the miscanthus plant, what's going on as it grows in the synthesis and things that technical side that we need to know. Emily uh, Heaton, PhD here in agronomy, grew up out in Monticello. Uh, grandparents, her parents still are, are out there. Um, she's who I worked with when she was a grad student. I was just so pleasantly pleased to see Iowa State had hired her. <laughs> Uh, and she's doing very well. She's bright, brilliant, a star at Iowa State, <clears throat> a wonderful speaker, and uh, is doing a great job. <clears throat> and it's a lot of fun to have her. And she's extraordinarily responsive to me uh, because partly I, I don't know if it's our backgrounds or what, but I write her an email with a question and I hear back in 24 hours or 48 hours. With, I don't know, you need to ask this. Here's a paper you might look at. You know, but she is so good at that. Uh, Dan Black in blue. Dan and I were the first two growers. Dan followed me the second year. He then retired and took a job with the company, Agricotech, as a consultant. And he kind of heads up the on someone from Iowa, not North Carolina. So what makes public engagement worthwhile and valuable? I think the many different forms of reciprocity, I mean, I've been thinking about it, just always be thinking about reciprocity and how the interchange exchange works and when to formalize them with contracts. I'm a big believer in contracts now because when I, I have a contract with Iowa and I was able to go through it and line out things I wouldn't support and put things in that I wanted. And they agreed to them all. It's just they had a standard contract, you know. So, but they allowed me, and one of them had to do with field conditions because I'm concerned about working fields too wet and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, contracts I think are really a useful communication tool when you work with an external partner, even if they're informal. But a, a, a memorandum of expectations, a memorandum of agreement, just something where. You and the partner both say, yes, that's because it'll be different. I mean, things happen, but at least you'll have a paragraph or two of what it is that you expect. And I never did any of that. You know, I, I regret that now. I wish that I'd put that as a part of our standards, you know, in public engagement that we begin to do that kind of thing. Um, there is a lot of exchange and interaction. Grad students are learning a tremendous amount about Muscanthus because they, you know, we have full field trials. I mean, we, we're people who are growing it in large 20, 60 acre fields, which are much different than research trials of 30 feet by 10 foot long. Uh, so they get a chance to go out and see how it's doing and get the spade and dig up the rhizomes and take a look at them in the spring and learn to know when one's alive and one's dead and make an estimate of what the rest of the field might be like and things that just don't work in the laboratory. So 
has a lot of value. It gives research questions. I mean, Emily interviews the growers all the time. What do you need to know? I'm going to go visit a professor in agronomy, Eric Sachs, uh, at 2 o'clock to talk about doing trials in Iowa because he has made a huge breakthrough in winter hardiness of this plant. But it's winter hardiness in Illinois. We don't know about winter hardiness in Iowa. And there is quite a bit of weather difference between Champaign and uh, Iowa City, even though Iowa City is on the southeast side of the state. So uh, very interesting. Eric asked me in, through email, said, bring with me what other traits you're interested in. You know, what else is your experience telling you you have it? So I got, I got a list for him. But that, you know, asking the people on the other side, what do you need to know? Helps inform the research questions because, as George and I were saying, faculty are all the time having to tweet their research grants to get money. And they would like, I mean, like to know what's going to be valuable to a congressman or to, a, you know, that a, someone might use or talk about as they're, even though if it's very basic research, because they hope that it leads to more funding. And it'll lead to more funding if it's found to be valuable. If it's found to be not valuable, they'll go someplace else. Business will go someplace else for investment, uh, the research dollars. So I think that whole partnership, people, it's a business. I think that's a side I never really understood in terms of working, at least in, with small businesses like me. Uh, I never thought about that piece of it, partly because we always worked with government agencies or school districts or whatever, but uh, cities. So um, that's my story. Uh,